Good afternoon and welcome. This is Gerhard Hüsken from Oberwolfach. Our speaker this afternoon is Rupert Frank from LMU Munich, and he will talk to us on leap tearing inequalities, what we know and what we want to know. Please. Well, thank you very much for this introduction. And thanks a lot to the prize committee for inviting me to, to um, give this presentation. I would like to talk about leap tearing inequalities and um, let me, without any further ado, let me tell you what these inequalities are. So you're given a bunch of functions, psi one through psi n. These are functions on Rd, and we're assuming that they're also normal. By this, we mean that, of course, the square of these functions integrates to one, and if you integrate two different functions against each other, you get zero. We assume also that the gradients of these functions are in the sense of distributions are square integrable. And then the sum of these integrals of the gradients control the square sum of these functions raised to a certain power one plus two over D. All right. So when N is equal to one, then this inequality up here reduces to a well-known Sobolev inequality. The point of the inequality, however, is that we can take n arbitrary, and in particular, we're interested in taking n rather large. And then the crucial feature of the inequality is that this constant k here can be chosen independently of the number n of functions. This independence of the constant on n is a consequence of the orthonormality. If you would drop that, then you could take all these functions to be equal. And then what you would have is on the left side, you have a sum of n terms. And on the right side, you have a sum of n terms raised to a power bigger than one. Of course, such an inequality cannot hold. Or put differently, you need to have this constant in the inequality going to zero. And you see that it would go to zero, like n to a certain power. And if you think a little bit more, then you'll see that this dependence on n is what you get just from the triangle inequality and the standard Sobolev inequality. So the message here is that orthonormality allows us to beat the triangle inequality. Okay, to get an improved constant compared with the triangle inequality. The Lipp-Tiering inequality was proved in 1975 by Lieb and Tiering in connection with the proof of stability of matter. This is a question from mathematical physics that they uh, resolved and the inequality in particular makes a connection to uh, an approximation in uh, quantum chemistry and in density functional theory. And I'll talk a little bit about this on my next slide, but for now, let me mention that since those works, this inequality has proved to be useful in various different contexts. For instance, in connection with the Navier-Stokes and other nonlinear evolution equations. And it has also been, uh, uh, realized as a general principle in harmonic analysis. And I will talk a little bit more about these items, but for now, let me go back to this original physics context um, and the motivation why Lieb and Turing came up with this inequality. And actually it was not this inequality up here from the previous slide that they were mainly interested in, but rather this somewhat more complicated looking inequality down there in the second block. Um, these two inequalities are equivalent to each other um, in the sense that the constants are the same and you can get one from the other. You need sort of a convexity argument to do that, but that's not uh, so important. Uh, so I will not go through this. So let's just read this inequality, what it says. So you have a function psi of very many variables, okay, of d times n variables. 
and we assume that it's square integrable on that space. Such a function we imagine as describing a quantum mechanical state of n particles where each particle moves in d dimensions. In addition, we assume that the function is anti-symmetric, which means that if you swap two coordinates, then you pick up a minus sign. This anti-symmetry corresponds to the orthonormality that I mentioned up here. And physically, it means that these particles that we are considering are fermions, like electrons, for example. Okay, and then the left side in this physics interpretation stands for the quantum mechanical kinetic energy of such a state. And you should think of this as something complicated. Well, because you have to do many, many integrals here and you have many, many gradients there. And what the inequality says is that this true quantum mechanical kinetic energy can be bounded by a much simpler looking question where first of all, you're integrating only over RD. And secondly, you don't have any gradients anymore. The quantity that appears on the right side is essentially the marginal of psi squared, okay? And this marginal raised to the power one plus two over D, that is the so-called Thomas Fermi approximation to the kinetic um, energy. And so what Lee Turing tells us is that this Thomas Fermi approximation is a rigorous, lower bound to the true quantum mechanical kinetic energy, at least provided you put some constant uh, there on the right side. The Lipturian inequality captures two fundamental principles of quantum mechanics, namely the uncertainty principle and the Pauli exclusion principle. Let me talk about this uncertainty principle first. So in quantum mechanics, one often thinks of psi squared as a probability density. And so what you have here is you have a probability density raised to a power bigger than one has a finite integral. That of course means that this probability density cannot concentrate too much on two small sets. That is the conclusion of the uncertainty principle. On the other hand, there's the Pauli exclusion principle. And this is often phrased of saying that two particles cannot occupy the same quantum state. Somehow more pictorially in this uh, setting of bounded kinetic energy, you can interpret this as saying that these particles have to go out of each other's way. To explain this better, let's look at the example I gave you before. Remember when I said, when we drop the orthonormality, so we drop the Pauli exclusion principle, then we could take all the psi n's equal. That would mean all the particles are in the same state and then they do sit on top of each other, right? That's exactly the situation that we wanna avoid by enforcing the Pauli exclusion principle or requiring this orthonormality, the particles have to spread out, go out of each other's way. And here's a picture that you might remember from high school uh, chemistry textbooks. These are atomic orbitals. You want to think of these functions as psi one, psi two, psi three, and so on. These are plots, the, the colors are the, the signs. And you see in order to enforce the orthogonality, the supports of these functions have to become larger and larger. And they, um, I mean, really try to avoid each other and occupy new spaces. And this is sort of what's captured by this Lipturian inequality. So I hope we see now what this inequality says. It's meaning, let us now come to the constant that appears in the inequality. And the question in particular that I wanna spend some slides on is what is the optimal value of this constant? That means what, how large can I choose this constant so that the inequality is true? And Lieben Thiering back in 1976 made a conjecture about the optimal value of that constant and there's an interesting dichotomy between small and large dimensions. In dimensions one and two, 
Lieben-Turing conjecture that this constant in inequality can be chosen to be this good old constant in the Sobolev inequality that we've seen at the beginning, the Sobolev inequality for a single function. So put differently, what this conjecture says is that if you want to choose the functions optimally so that you get the largest possible value here for the quotient, then what you want to do is you want to choose these functions psi n very, very far from each other so that they essentially disjointly support it. And then once they're disjoint, you apply simply the one function inequality for each piece and then you sum up and then you get the inequality for any func for uh, the n functions with the same constant. That should be the optimality scenario. So what this predicts is that there's a repulsive force in one and two dimensions. The psi n's want to go away from each other. In dimensions three and larger, on the other hand, Lipturing um, conjecture that you would need in order to saturate the optimal uh, the inequality with optimal constant, you would need infinitely many functions. And not any infinitely many functions, but you wanna choose them in a certain nice way such that this density here on the right side becomes essentially constant. So think of the psi n's as these plane waves e to the ipx, where p is a parameter and runs, say, through, through a certain ball. Okay. Now, of course, you need to think a little bit um, how to make these functions square integrable on the whole space. You need some approximation and so on, but that can be done, and that gives you a certain value for the constant. This is related to what in physics is known as the free Fermi gas. Okay, but the main point is that in dimension three and higher, you think that there's an attractive force that pushes the functions together. I mean, the, the functions want to sit close together. Of course, by the Pauli principle, they cannot sit exactly on top of each other, but they can build up one next to the other. So all together, it becomes a constant density. And so if this Lipturing conjecture in three dimensions would be correct, and if this constant was given by this plane wave scenario, that would mean that this hand waving Thomas Fermi approximation from quantum chemistry is actually a rigorous lower bound to quantum mechanics. And this would be a fundamental result in density functional theory. Okay. So, um, that's one reason why this is important. But secondly, also, I think this basic idea that this one and the same Pauli exclusion principle has so different features in small and in high dimensions is an intriguing physical phenomenon that is, as far as I understand, not even understood on a physical level of rigor. And so needless to say, this conjecture is open. Now here are two results that I would like to present to you. The first result, uh, which was obtained with 100 mark EX and NUM published last year, concerns which values for this constant we can actually take, right? So perhaps we cannot prove it with the optimal constant that leap in Turing conjectured, but perhaps we can prove it with some other constant which is not too far from it. So here there's this constant K with TF for Thomas Fermi as a superscript. And we got a lower bound. So the inequality holds with KD equal to the right side. And in three dimensions, this means that we can take the constant to be at least 77% of the conjectured constant. And so this should be compared with the original value if, of Turing's proof that was about 18% and that value has increased. And so right now we are at the 77%. And I think for many applications, this is um, a quite reasonable number. But of course, it's not the optimal number. The second result about these constants that I want to discuss with you is somewhat more conceptual. I have emphasized that this constant k can be chosen independently of the number of functions. But that does not prevent us to define a constant k super n 
as that constant for which the inequality holds with at most n functions, right? So artificially, we restrict ourselves to at most n functions. That defines a non-decreasing sequence of, uh, no, sorry, non-increasing sequence of constants. And of course, the limit of that sequence is the one constant for which the inequality holds with an arbitrary number of functions. And so the theorem obtained together with Gonti and Levine, also published last year, is that under the assumption that we're in three and higher dimensions, there's a sequence of integers n going to infinity along which these constants are really strictly monotone. Okay, so this really means that in dimensions three and higher, we do not want to have only finitely many functions. We want to take more and more functions to arrive at the optimal constant. Okay, it is, as far as I know, the first time that this attractive force has been observed that you um, want to keep fun bring functions together. And, <clears throat> of our proof works in dimensions three and higher as it should, and it does not work in dimensions one and two, which is consistent with this conjecture, okay? But of course, sort of, um, we still don't know what this constant KD really is. And um, in particular, the conjecture was, if you remember that we get this sort of plane wave thing where, where things become constant, all right? Now, I want to talk a little bit more about this theorem, but I would like to phrase it in a different um, equivalent and then generalized version. So let me talk about this now. This is the family of Lipterian inequalities for eigenvalues of Schrodinger operators. We look at Schrodinger operators minus Laplacian plus V where V stands for multiplication by a function V that is real valued and goes to zero at infinity. And then you can realize this operator as a self-adjoint operator in L2 of RD. And the negative spectrum of this operator is discrete, consisting of eigenvalues that accumulate at most at the point zero. Let's denote these eigenvalues by Ej, and what we're interested in is raising these eigenvalues to a power gamma and then summing all these negative eigenvalues. And the Lipterian inequality in the spectral version says that this eigenvalue sum is controlled by the integral of a power of the negative part of the potential V. Okay with a constant, of course, that only depends on this power gamma and on the dimension d that you're in. The validity of this inequality, by this I mean the range of gammas for which it holds has completely been settled. The question that we wanna address is again, what about the optimal constants in this inequality? Now we wanna find the smallest possible L such that the inequality holds. And there's a conjecture by Lipturing, which says, again, there are two regimes, two special regimes, and the optimal constant should be given by the verse ones of the constants of these two regimes. Now, let me explain these two different uh, constants that uh, Lip and Turing consider as their candidates. The first one is this constant L1. And to define that constant, let's look at the following sort of isoparametric type. So imagine I give you the value of this integral of a power of the negative part of the potential. That's a fixed constant. And I ask you, ask you to find among all Schrodinger operators with potential having that integral, the one that has the smallest eigenvalue, okay? And well, such a potential exists, 
one can prove a lot of things about them, but then the important thing for us right now here is that this comes along with an inequality, which simply bounds this lowest eigenvalue, this optimal lowest eigenvalue by this given integral. Okay, that defines the constant L1. Put differently, the inequality that we're talking about is the one where you just ignore the sum here. Just forget the sum. You want to bound a single eigenvalue by the integral of the potential. The best constant in that inequality, that by definition is L1. The other constant corresponds to having many eigenvalues. How do we get that? Well, you look now at the operator where in front of the potential, you put a large constant lambda and you let that constant go to infinity. Now, of course, the eigenvalues will depend on that constant and there will be more and more eigenvalues as you increase this constant. Weil's asymptotic formula allows us to compute the asymptotics of this um, eigenvalue sum and namely, you can compute it by computing a phase space integral. That's the leading order asymptotics as lambda goes to infinity. And then you can do this integral, or more precisely, you can integrate out the psi variable, and you get something which looks very much like the right side of the Lipteering inequality, except possibly that you get a different constant. By definition, L classical is the constant that you get down here. And necessarily, the constant for which this uniform non-asymptotic inequality holds needs to be um, or cannot be uh, strictly smaller than that constant. OK, so that explains the Lipterian conjecture. And I hope you see already that this is somewhat similar in flavor to this conjecture that I was mentioning before concerning these uh, systems of orthonormal functions. Right? There's also like back then there was one function. Here it's one eigenvalue as one possibility. Back then it was many, many functions having this uh, constant density. Over here we have these many functions with this uh, semi classical structure. And this, of course, no coincidence because this inequality here, when gamma is equal to one, then this Lip Turing inequality in the spectral form is equivalent to this Sobolev inequality that we've seen before. By equivalent, I mean really that the optimal constants are in one-to-one -one correspondence and also cases of equality. Okay, good. So this is the Lipterian conjecture for general values of gamma. Uh, people have worked on this in the past four and a half decades, and there have been quite a number of results where this conjecture has actually been verified. This is some beautiful mathematics. I've listed here some references, but unfortunately I cannot um, go through this in detail. I should say that there's also equally beautiful mathematics where the conjecture was shown to fail. So this depends now on what gamma is in which dimension. Okay, so sometimes it holds, sometimes it doesn't. And still for the uh, large part, uh, we don't know. And in particular, as I mentioned before, the physically most relevant case where gamma is equal to one is still an open case. So now let me phrase the result that I was mentioning before in this dual version or generalized version uh, where we look at the spectral um, inequality concerning the eigenvalues of Schrodinger operators. I was telling you that the Lipterian inequality allows us to bound all the eigenvalues. We do the same thing that we did before. We artificially restrict the sum to only bound n eigenvalues, the smallest n eigenvalues, that define certain constants L superscript n. Now these constants are um, non-decreasing, and of course their limit is the one constant that works for an arbitrary number of eigenvalues. And then our result says that there's a sequence of integers going to infinity along which these constants are strictly increasing. 
under the assumption that the, pa the, the power that appears on top of the potential is strictly greater than two. Now, if gamma is equal to one, this condition translates into the condition D is greater or equal than three that we've seen on the previous slide, okay? What this result says is that, I mean, what it implies in particular is new cases where the Lipterian conjecture fails. So some of these cases where this is a new result is in dimensions two and in dimensions three in the physical dimensions. And what's sort of interesting about this result is that both it gives both a counterexample to the Lipterian conjecture in certain regimes, but on the other hand, it also gives credence to its validity in the case gamma equal to one, which is, I mean, which is exactly where this method of proof fails and where, um, I mean, if the conjecture would not hold, it would have to be due to a completely different mechanism. If I have to explain in a few sentences what makes our proof work, then let me talk first about a certain locality that this Lipterian inequality has. By this, I mean, that imagine the case that your potential consists of two pieces that are wildly separated in space. One way over there, one way over there. Then the eigenvalues of the Schrodinger operators with the two pieces is essentially the union of the eigenvalues of the Schrodinger operator with just one piece of the potential sitting over here and another Schrodinger operator with a potential sitting over there, okay? And so the eigenfunction, you think of them, they are very strongly localized close to either this piece of the potential or that piece of the potential. The Lipterian inequality respects this sort of additivity, right? So the eigenvalues come into groups, namely those from the left side and those from the right side. And similarly, the integral of the potential splits into two pieces, that coming from the left side and that coming from the right side. This locality of the Lipterian inequality, that's, I mean, one of its crucial features and one of the reason why it is so um, important in many applications, including in uh, local density approximation and so on. Um, what our proof does, it is it exhibits an exponentially small violation of that locality. So what we show is that there is an exponentially small term, attractive term that does not, not want the two pieces of the potential go apart from each other. And that's exactly this force which keeps stuff together under this assumption that gamma satisfies this. Now, this is really a very tiny effect. And even after we had proved this result analytically, we wanted to check it numerically. And it was very hard to really pin this down and find this effect um, numerically. But eventually, it, it was possible. And what I also want to mention is that this result suggests a different optimality scenario, which was not considered originally by Lieb and Thiering, namely what we should look at the optimal constant being given by periodic but non-constant V. That is again uh, an approximation. I mean, you, what does it mean that you look at a periodic V where this inequality, where the, the side of the inequality is of course not finite. Um, but that one can make sense of this. And one way to make sense of this is, for instance, you look at the optimal V for a fixed N, you normalize things appropriately, and then you take a limit of such optimal Vs, and you hope that this converges to some periodic configuration. And what we are saying is, or the semi-classical constant, or the Thomas Fermi approximation corresponds to a constant periodic function, right? But now what we are saying is it might be worth looking at non-constant such functions and look at the Lipterian constant in such a regime. 
And we can analytically verify in dimension one for a certain value of gamma that um, this is actually a potential optimizer. And we do have numerical evidence in two dimensions close to a certain critical value that with a periodic potential, you can beat both um, suggestions by Liebentiering. And this is a numerical picture of such a numerically optimal um, periodic with respect to triangular lattice potential that does better than, than this. And this is a tiny, tiny effect. I mean, you should look at these, these numbers here by how much you can, you can beat this line is the, the one line that you want to beat. And you can beat it by a tiny, tiny amount. But, and also for, for gamma in a tiny, tiny window. But it seems like that this is possible. And if this is true, we have the following picture of sort of a phase transition. When the gamma parameter in the Lipterian inequality is small, then this potential, the optimal con potential consists of one piece, or if you want to think of it periodically, it's sort of like an, a configuration with an infinitely large period. Now then, when you increase gamma, this period gets shorter and we get a truly periodic structure. And then at some uh, critical value, um, this periodic structure will just become flat. So this, in this sense, we can think of there uh, as being a phase transition with respect to the parameter gamma. This is, of course, only a, a scenario that we think would be nice to explore, but uh, this is something to be done in the future. Now, this concludes the first part of my talk. And let me summarize where we are so far. We've seen a classical inequality in analysis, namely the Sobolev inequality. And we've seen that this has a generalization to a setting of orthonormal functions. And in contrast to the, the brute force, you know, if you just apply the function for one uh, function, the inequality for one function and apply the triangle inequality, if you impose the orthonormality, then this gives you a better behavior of the constant compared to the triangle inequality. And when I phrase this like this, then the question is very natural. Well, this is actually a general principle that holds also for other kind of inequalities. And then, of course, we're not interested in this only theoretically, but we wonder if such a generalization of other inequalities exist, does this have any use? If I phrase this question more formally, imagine you're given a bounded linear operator T acting from a Hilbert space into an LQ space with Q greater than two. The boundedness of this operator means that if you integrate T psi raised to the power Q, then this is bounded by a constant for all normalized vectors psi. Now let's imagine again, you have a bunch of orthonormal functions psi n. You apply t to each one of them, and then you sum their squares. Now you want to raise the same thing to the power q over two, right? Because you have a square already there. And then the triangle inequality would tell you that this left side here is bounded by n to the q divided by two that ignores completely the orthonormality. The question that I'm raising is, is it possible that there is, exists a certain exponent sigma strictly smaller than q over two, such that the left side is bounded by n to the sigma, that it grows slower as the number of functions increases? And to tell you the answer to this question, yes, such an inequality exists, at least for, for certain operators, but there is not a universal answer. I mean, there is not one value of sigma that works, but which sigma you can pick really depends on the operator t in question. And what I claim is that by finding out which sigma to take, we understand this operator t better. A classical example of such an inequality goes back to Lieb from 1983. 
And this is related to the theorem of fractional integration, also known as the weak young inequality or the hardy little wood sobolev inequality. And remember what that says, you take a function in L2, you convolve it with an inverse power of X, and then you raise it to a certain power that depends on the dimension and the power of X that you've chosen. The conclusion is that the LQ norm of such an, uh, an, an object is finite for L2 functions. Now let's do the same thing for orthonormal functions. So let's convolve each and every one of them with the inverse power of X, compute the square sum, raise it to the power. And then the theorem is, yes, this can be bounded by a power of N. The exponent happens to be one. Number one, this bound, the exponent one here beats the triangle inequality, right? So sig one, the power up here is strictly smaller than this power up there. And secondly, this is the power exponent one here is optimal in this inequality. And concerning the second question, yes, this inequality is useful. This is equivalent to a bound on the number of negative eigenvalues of generalized Schrodinger operators through an integral of the potential, somewhat similar to the, the Lipturing inequalities that we've seen before. Here on this slide, which is essentially my last slide, I've given you two examples of classical inequalities from harmonic analysis, which do have such an extension to orthonormal functions. The two inequalities in question are the Strichert's inequality and the stein thomas inequality. Let me begin with the Strichert's inequality, which quantifies the dispersive behavior of solutions of the free Schrodinger equation. So if you have an L2 function psi and you time evolve it according to the free Schrodinger equation, then L2 theory tells us that the L2 norm does not change. The Strichert's inequality in contrast quantifies a dispersive phenomenon. Namely, you raise this time evolved psi to a certain power integrate with respect to X, potentially you raise it to a different power and then you integrate with respect to T and this is finite. And so this tells you that at least in some sense, this integral that you integrate with respect to T has to become small as T goes to infinity. And that is this dispersive effect that this wave function somehow spreads out um, as time goes by. And this inequality is really fundamental in, for instance, the area of dispersive PDEs. And um, many arguments rely on it. What we proved here is a version of the inequality for orthonormal functions, psi n. Okay, so you think of the psi n's as initial data. You time evolve each one according to the free Schrodinger equation and you sum the resulting squares. Now you do the same thing, right? Raising to power, integrating, raising to another power, integrating. And then our claim is that this thing is bounded by a power of N and two important things. Number one, this power of N beats the power from the triangle inequality. And number two, this power of N is actually best possible meaning we can cook up a sequence of psi n's along which this power of n is actually saturated. And this is sort of done using a type of a Thomas Fermi um, construction, not unlike what we've seen before um, in connection with the usual Lipturing inequality. And this inequality actually has found applications, for instance, on the dynamics of large fermionic systems. The second inequality that I would like to mention is the stein thomas inequality. It's an inequality from Fourier restriction theory. And so from the point of Fourier restriction theory, Strichatz and stein thomas are very uh, similar to each other. Um, 
the way I've stated the inequality actually is rather a Fourier extension inequality. And what I mean by this is, so you have a function living on the sphere and which is square integrable there. Then you compute its Fourier transform in the sense of measures and you get a function in RD and you ask yourself, how fast does this function on RD decay at infinity? And you wanna measure this decay with finding a membership to LP where P is as small as possible. And the smallest possible such P was determined by Stein and Thomas. And um, this is their inequality with N equal to one. What we proved here was the corresponding version for orthonormal functions, Psi N, where again, we have a power of N on the right side where the power beats the triangle inequality and where the power is best possible. And once again, let me emphasize that this inequality is useful. It is again useful in the study of eigenvalues of Schrodinger operators, but now interestingly, what you're looking at is Schrodinger operators with complex potentials. Such operators appear, for instance, in nuclear physics, and they have the feature that the eigenvalues can now accumulate at mm, the positive half line. And this is where you need to work hard and where such inequalities come into play. Yet another application of this inequality is that you can get bounds for the Kakeya maximal functions and such bounds imply then, for instance, that the Hausdorff dimension of a Kakeya set is at least d plus one over two. This is of course not a new result. However, as far as I know, it's the first time that this result has been obtained purely with L2 methods. What I told you so far has emphasized the common features between these inequalities. But I want to emphasize that really you should, these are all different inequalities and you have to treat each operator separately. And in particular, this refers to the construction of these counterexamples where there's a somewhat different mechanism really appearing in every case and where you need techniques from semi-classical analysis or micro-local analysis to really carry out uh, this construction. As open questions, I want to mention that this regime for which I stated the Stichert's inequality, this is not the full regime where it is valid. There's a different region where the effect of orthogonality is not quite as strong. So there's a sort of a dividing line where things become suddenly different and there are certain endpoint cases that are open. And so I think this would be interesting and also to, to see really a difference between the scalar and the um, orthonormal function versions. And finally, for these inequalities, there are natural candidates for the one particle constant I mean, the standard optimal Stichert's inequality and the Stein-Thomas Stein inequality. And then based on our optimality construction, there are sort of also these infinitely many particle constants. But uh, whether there's an analog of the Lipterian conjecture or more generally, some good values of these constants have not been investigated at all so far. This brings me to the end of the talk. Let me briefly summarize what I told you. We've discussed the Lipterian inequalities, which mathematically rigorously quantify what the uncertainty principle and the Pauli exclusion principles say. And I've told you that these inequalities have applications in mathematical physics analysis and PDE beyond this original context. I've also told you about this quest of finding optimal constants and some recent progress in that direction, and in particular towards optimal configurations. And then I've told you that this philosophy of Lipterian inequalities, I mean inequalities for orthonormal constants, actually is a general principle that works for many inequalities in harmonic analysis. I've given you two examples, the Strichertz and the Stein-Thomas inequalities. I've shown you optimal versions corresponding to the how the const the, the, the the dependence on the number of functions grows. And I've shown you that these new inequalities actually have a number of interesting applications. With this, I would like to end and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice lecture. Unfortunately, we cannot take questions live. 
uh, please address uh, questions about the lecture directly to the speaker by email or use the discourse forum set up on the ICM website. Thank you all for attending and bye bye. Thank you. That was very nice. Thank you very much. I learned a lot. Thank you. <laughs>